Hello and welcome. It's January 2024 and this is the the first Blowing Smoke podcast of the year. Our topic today is noir or neo-noir. Well, maybe both. So unless you want to be sleeping with the fishes, light up and listen in. So film noir. It's a cinematic term used primarily to describe stylized Hollywood crime dramas, particularly those that emphasize cynical attitudes and motivations and of like the 1940s and 1950s, which are basically generally regarded as the classic period of American film noir. Now, the French term of noir translates literally to English as dark film. Because they were quite both dark in lighting and in sinister stories, often presented in a shadowy cinematic style. Neo-noir has a similar style, but with updated themes, content, style, and visual elements. Neo-noir is a genre of films that use the visual style and themes of classic film noir, but add a modern sensibility. They, all, they also uh, usually contain more graphic depictions of violence and sexuality. So, let's, uh, let's talk about, like, noir in general. You know, how it's basically a visual novel for the senses and really plays factor into emotions, themes, nuance, atmosphere, settings, and places. Basic stuff that's contained in neo-noir, a city that never sleeps. Usually dark and gritty, wet streets and twinkling lights. Crime is prominent, sex and mystery. Detectives, dames, and bad guys slash girls. Diners. Newsstand boys yelling out the news. Tommy guns rattling out bullet holes into walls. Dark clubs or bars with a sultry crooner singing in satin and sequins. Champagne, martinis, cigars, cigarettes. And an inner monologue that keeps you in your seat. So some popular neo-noir from like around the late 80s all the way up into the 2000s. Let's start with Who Framed Roger Rabbit, 1988. So this is a 1988 American fantasy comedy, and it was directed by Robert Zemeckis. Um, screenplay written by Jeffrey Price and Peter Seaman. It is loosely based on the 1981 novel Who Censored Roger Rabbit by Gary K. Wolf. The, like, the film has Bob Haskins, uh, Christopher Lloyd, Stubby K, Joanna Cassidy, and the voice of Charles Fleister. Combining live action and animation, the film is set in an alternate history Hollywood in 1947, where humans and cartoon characters, referred to as Toons, uh, coexist. And its plot follows Eddie, private investigator with a grudge against Toons, who must help exonerate Roger Rabbit, a Toon who is framed for murder. Great movie. And it's a, even though it's a fantasy comedy and there is, you know, elements of like detectives and stuff like that. And, it, and it, it's still considered neo noir, at least to me. Uh, then we have Dick Tracy, which was uh, 1990. Warren Beatty produced, directed, and co wrote it, uncredited, and starred in the 1990 film. Uh, supporting cast was Al Pacino, Madonna, Glenn Headley, and uh, Charlie Corsmo. Dick Tracy depicts the detective's romantic relationships with Breathless Mahoney and Tess Trueheart, as well as his conflicts with crime boss, Big Boy Caprice, and his henchmen. Tracy also begins fostering a young street urchin named Kid. Development of the film began began in the early 1980s, um, and then the screenplay was written by Jim Cash and Jack Epps Jr., uh, both of top from Top Gun, and the project also went through many different directors, from 
Steven Spielberg, John Landis, Walter Hill, uh, Richard Benjamin, before the arrival of Warren Beatty. It was filmed mainly in Universal Studios. Uh, Danny Elfman, Elfman was hired to compose the score, and the film's music and songs were featured on three separate soundtrack albums. So this is another movie where it's really great neo-noir. So it takes stuff from like the 1940s, 50s, and um, kind of slightly modernized it. Slightly. But it still holds true, and it's a really great film. It's one of those sleeper things. Not everybody likes Dick Tracy. I particularly do. And then we have The Rocketeer. Now this one, not a, people, I don't, not a lot of people have seen it. Not a lot of people like it. So The Rocketeer was uh, in 1991, and it was released internationally as The Adventures of The Rocketeer. So it is a 1991 American period superhero film from Walt Disney and Touchstone Pictures. It was produced by Charles Gordon and, Lo and Lawrence Gordon and uh, Lloyd Levin. It was directed by Joe Johnston and it stars Billy Campbell, Jennifer Connelly, Ellen Arkin, Timothy Dalton, Paul Sorvino, and um, Tiny Ron Taylor. And it's based off the character of the same name created by comic book artist and writer Dave Stevens. It's set in 1938, Los Angeles, California. The Rocketeer tells the story of a stunt pilot, which is uh, Cliff Seckard, who discovers a hidden rocket pack and then thereafter uses it to fly without the need of an aircraft. And his, hero his heroic deeds soon attract the attention of Howard Hughes and the FBI, who are hunting for like the missing rocket pack, as well as like Nazi operatives that stole it from Hughes. It's a really great movie for surprisingly Disney and Touchstone back in 1991. It doesn't really get a lot of praise and not a lot of people really like it, but it actually is a really good neo-noir film. Um, another one which is actually one of my all-time favorites is The Shadow, 1994. So The Shadow, let's see, uh, a it's a, he was a, the character was adapted once again into a feature film. So this used to be like an old comic, just like Dick Tracy was an old comic. And The Shadow uh, stars like Alec Baldwin as Lamont Cranston and Penelope Ann Miller as Margot Lane, with John Lone playing um, the reoccurring, reoccurring Asian villain from the pulp series Shiwan Khan, who claims to be a direct descendant of Genghis Khan. As the film opens, Cranston has become um, evil and corrupt and is uh, known as Ying Po, which literally translates to Dark Eagle. Um, he's a brutal war warlord and opium smuggler in the early 1930s in Mongolia. Ying Po is kidnapped by agents of a mysterious holy man, which is the Tolku, who knows the uh, warlord is actually Lamont Cranston of New York, and he says that he is determined to reform the man. And since Cranston knows that the evil that lurks inside of his own heart, he will be effective in knowing and fighting such evil in other men, and will learn to tap into his latent psychic power. Resistant at first, Cranston accepts that he is now under the Toku's control. Um, over time, he reforms and learns how to read thoughts as well as to cloud men's minds to alter their perception and make himself invisible. Cranston eventually returns to his native New York and takes up the guise of the mysterious crime fighter, The Shadow, in payment to humanity for his past evil misdeeds. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The Shadow knows. And what's really great is because it's, you know, it's, it's set in the 1930s. There's, um, there's clubs, um, the sultry singer thing. And uh, Tim Curry's actually in this movie, and he's really great too. Um, lot, lots of other like little tidbits here and there, and Easter eggs in the shadow that most people probably don't even really notice. But it is a really great neo noir movie. But the most perfect example of neo noir is actually Sin City. So Sin City, also known as Frank Miller's Sin City, was in 2005 and is a 2005 American neo-noir crime anthology film 
directed by Robert Rodriguez and Frank Miller, based on Miller's comic book series of the same name. Much of the film is based on the first, third, and fourth books in Miller's original comic book series. The Hard Goodbye is about an ex-convict who, who embarks on a rampage in search of his one-time sweetheart's killer. The Big Fat Kill follows a private investigator who's caught in a street war between a group of prostitutes and a group of mercenaries, the police and the mob. The Yellow Bastard focuses on the aging, the aging police officer who protects a young woman from a grotesquely disfigured serial killer. The intro and the outro of the film are based on the short story, The Customer is Always Right, which is, a co which is collected in booze, broads, and bullets, the sixth book of the comic book series. The film stars a uh, great cast with Jessica Alba, Benicio Del Toro, Brittany Murphy, Clive Owen, Mickey Rourke, Bruce Willis, and Elijah Wood. Um, features um, Alexis Bledel, Powers Booth, Michael Clark Duncan, Rosario Dawson, Devin Akoy, um, let's see, Jamie King, Michael Madsen, Nick Stahl, and Mackenzie Vega, among others. And that was just the first one. Um, the sequel to it, which is Sin City, A Dame to Kill For, also known as Frank Miller's Sin City, A Dame to Kill For, was 2014. So in 2014, this action crime anthology film was the follow-up to the 2005 Sin City, directed by Robert Rodriguez and Frank Miller. The script is written by Miller and is primarily based off the second book in Sin City series by Miller, A Dame to Kill For. One of the smaller plots from the film is based on a short story, Just Another Saturday Night, which is collected in Booze, Broads, and Bullets, the sixth book in the comic series. Two original stories, which is uh, The Long Bad Night and Nancy's Last Dance, were created exclusively for the film and written by Miller. The film stars um, some returning cast members, which is Ricky, Mickey, Mickey Rourke, Jessica Alba, Rosario Dawson, Jamie King, Powers Booth, and in his final film role, Bruce Willis. Newcomers to the series include Josh Brolin, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Ava Green, Dennis Habert, Ray Liotta, Christopher Lloyd, Jamie Chung, Jeremy Piven, Christopher Maloney, Stacey Keach, Lady Gaga, Alexis Vega, Julie, G Julie Garner, and Juno Temple. And it's really done great. Um, just the style of the movie. It literally looks like an old noir comic book but it's still technically neo noir so neo noir is so well done and it's so suspenseful that you know it still holds weight today for today's audience uh this is because of a few things the plot points the narrative devices are all raw and carnal and the simplicity and the themes that never grow old just make them timeless the social importance of neo-noir is grounding in its big themes of race, class, gender, and systematic corruption. The overreaching and lasting appeal of noir is that it makes doom fun. Can't praise it enough. So, I hope you enjoyed this quick little podcast. And, uh, not sure what the next one's going to be, but, you know, it's January. 2024 figured I'd start out with something get back on the ball and start you know doing my podcast here um so if you like this and you want more go ahead and like share subscribe you know and then tune in for the next one now you stay creepy like Kimiko Kusanagi okay bye